If you're a new player wanting tips to elevate your game and take you to the next level, stick around. If you want to get good at Civ 6, subscribe and click the bell to keep up with the channel. Before we get going here, I guess I should start out with a little disclaimer. I don't consider any of the following tips to be game breaking or shady by any means. I think mechanics like storing your production so you can instantly build things goes past the line for me though. I even go as far as saying that's basically the equivalent to playing with cheat codes enabled. But hey, that's just my opinion. I'm sure they're going to be people out there who might feel the same about things that I'm about to mention in this video. So don't use them. Or better yet, be sure to tell me how I'm a horrible person and I suck at Civ 6 down in the comment section. Alright, now that we have that out of the way, let's get you your tips. These aren't in any specific order, just thought I should mention that too before we get going here. So the first thing we're going to show you today is an effective way to boost your gold per turn income. This method is obviously a lot more effective if you're playing a somewhat peaceful game, but can still be used in domination games. As long as you have spare strategic resources or have just moved further along in the tech tree and don't need a certain resource for your armies. The first thing you need to do in order for this to work is to bring the AI's standing gold count down to zero. You can specifically target an AI whose treasury is low, or choose just about anyone and use your luxury resources or trading your diplomatic favor to put a big dent in their bank account. Before you go and waste your resources though, you need to make sure that the AI is actually interested in whatever strategic resources you have to trade them first. You find this out by offering to trade them one unit of the resource. If they're willing to pay anything more than one piece of gold for it, then you're good to go and this strategy will work. In my experience, AIs who are more aggressive like Cleopatra, Alexander, and Amanatori, for example, are more likely to be interested in your strategic resources. Also, they're by far more likely to stay interested in the resources after they've gotten the minimum amount needed to use for creating a unit. So when you find an AI who wants your strategic resource, preferably who has very few, and in a perfect world, no copies of the said resource at the moment, trade until they have no gold left. Once they are at zero gold, you simply offer them one copy of your strategic resource at a time. While this can be irritating, it's definitely worth the investment of your time if you ask me. The AI will trade you one gold per turn for each copy of your strategic resource you offer in this way. They'll continue to do this until you've reached the amount needed to make a unit, generally 20 is when they lose interest, or they have no more gold per turn income to trade you. When you're searching for AIs to use this trading method, it's best if you can manage to find one who's interested in more than one type of strategic resource that you have. This way, you don't have to get multiple AIs gold stockpiled down to zero in order to trade away your excess strategic resources. As I mentioned, this technique is most effective when you're playing a fairly peaceful game, ideally after you have your neighboring AIs locked down and are safe and sound. You definitely don't want to be caught with your pants down by a hostile neighbor and not have the strategic resources you need to create the units to defend yourself. So the next tip is basically going to be me expanding on what I just mentioned. No, not more about trading strategic resources in that way, but about locking down your neighboring AI so that you can stay safe and sound. If you're trying to win with either culture, science, or a diplomatic victory, it's usually most effective if you can manage to avoid going to war. This is because the production and investment of turns it takes for you to build armies can be put to better use helping you achieve things that are relevant to your chosen victory condition. By far, the easiest way to go about your business in peace is to declare friendships with your neighboring civilizations. Declaring a friendship gives you a guaranteed 30 turns on standard time settings where that AI can't attack you no matter what. You're free to piss them off by forward settling them, breaking promises, attacking city-states they're suzerain of, you name it, and they can't do shit about it. What you might not know though is that once you've declared a friendship with an AI, you can lock down that friendship for the entire game. Even if you've generated grievances against that civilization, they'll still maintain the friendship with you no matter what kind of shit you pull. The key is that you have to pay close attention. As long as you notice the friendship has expired on the exact turn that it does, the AI will automatically accept another declaration of friendship despite any grievances they have against you. This only works if you manage to catch it on the exact turn it expires though. If you don't notice until the following turn, you're gonna be shit out of luck if you done things to piss them off. Now, if you're new to the game, you might be thinking that sounds nice and all, but how the hell are you supposed to get them to declare friendships? Generally speaking, this is pretty easy to do. First and foremost, you want to send a delegation to them on the very first turn you meet in AI. This is the only turn where they are guaranteed to accept your delegation. After that, they'll reject it unless you've done other things to establish a positive relationship with them. Another thing you can do is simply send a trade route to the AI to improve your relationship. You can also give them gifts. 
If you gift an AI 100 gold, it almost guarantees that they'll be more interested in friendship. I don't know about you, but I don't consider myself to be above good old fashioned bribery. Last but not least, the most effective way to improve your relationship is to trigger an AI leader's leadership agenda. This part comes with more experience as you play through the game. Off the top of my head, doing things like having cities with high populations near Eleanor of France, having a lot of districts works great for getting a good relationship with Nubia, building lots of cities helps you with Rome, and sharing any luxury resources you have with Monty of the Aztecs will get you on his good side. Every AI has multiple agendas that if you satisfy them will go a long way towards making them receptive to your offer of friendship. You can always check to see the first agenda they have on the main page of the diplomacy section. You can reveal their other agendas later on in the game, but to do this you have to increase your layers of diplomatic visibility. If you're enjoying the video so far, do me a favor and take a second to hit the like button. It goes a long way to help a small channel like me get discovered. Better yet, leave a comment on here. Call me an asshole if you want to. Any engagement helps. Anyway, let's get back to what we're here for. Next up, we're going to talk about diplomatic favor. This tip works for every type of victory condition you can try for other than for a diplomatic victory, for obvious reasons. In case you don't know, the AIs will trade for your diplomatic favor like it's crap. They literally can't get enough of it. They will almost always be willing to trade you between 9 and 16 pieces of gold for each point of diplomatic favor. Also, something to remember is that they'll trade you more gold if you offer them multiple points of diplomatic favor in the same trade. For instance, an AI who's willing to pay you 10 gold for one point of diplomatic favor will almost always agree to pay you 29 gold for two points. As you start to trade diplomatic favor more, you'll stumble into AIs who are willing to pay you an even higher premium for your favor points. At first, I thought that was based on the civilization's lack of interest in war, two that I find this to be the case with was Pericles' version of Greece and China. However, after playing a specific game to test this theory for this video, I found out that isn't the case. My new theory is that it's depending on whether or not they happen to be chasing a diplomatic victory in the game, but I have more testing to do before I can say this with any certainty. One thing I can say for sure is that all of the AIs are a lot more willing to pay more for diplomatic favor the closer you get to the end of your current World Congress session. This basically goes for every civil in the game as far as I can tell. Ultimately, you're going to have to make a decision for yourself whether or not you think trading your diplomatic favor to basically have a crazy high gold income is worth not having any sway or very little when it comes to the World Congress sessions or the opportunities to participate in or call for emergencies. I think that 9 times out of 10, this is a trade that I'm more than happy to make. The only time I get a little bit salty is when the opportunity to boost production in my chosen victory types buildings by 100% comes up and I can't force the vote in my favor. With that being said, there is a way that you can have the best of both worlds and have lots of diplomatic favor to sell off for insane gold income and still have plenty left over to force your ideal world congress choices or defend yourself against an AI who's getting close to a diplomatic victory. That's coming up towards the end of the video though, so stick around. Won't be too much longer. Moving on here, your next tip is going to be a pretty simple one to be honest. It's to really start paying attention to the quest the city-states offer you in every era. This was honestly a part of the game I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to for quite some time. Now that trading diplomatic favor can have such a huge impact on your game though, I basically do everything I possibly can to achieve all the quests city-states offer in an era so that they reset and offer you an additional quest every time the era moves ahead. It goes without saying that you should prioritize completing quests and becoming the suzerain of city-states that help your particular victory type, whether it's religious, scientific, culture, etc. But sometimes, they just have absurd quests like build an encampment in the ancient era when you're going for a science win, and it just doesn't make any sense for you to do that. In this case, just do whatever you can without taking a hit to your win condition. For instance, becoming a suzerain of an industrial city-state in a science or culture game can be a great thing because it'll help you build certain wonders faster. But even if you were to take that bonus away, it would still be worth it just to gain the diplomatic favor point per turn you earn for being suzerain of them. If you put a little effort in, you can essentially guarantee becoming suzerain of at least one city-state in the ancient era. This is extremely effective if the city-state has a nice bonus for your win condition, but still, a huge boost even if it doesn't. A suzerainship is essentially an income of at least 10 gold per turn, which in the ancient era and even parts of the classical can essentially mean doubling your gold per turn income, which definitely comes in handy. It's because of this being so powerful that I've totally changed around my early game starts as far as civics go. I basically always pursue foreign trade into early empire so that I can gain access to the mysticism civic and earn myself the envoy that comes along with it before I change gears and head towards craftsmanship and state workforce. A great early one 
wonder that you can pursue to ideally gain control of at least two or three city-states in the beginning of the classical era is the Oppendana. It's unlocked for you when you acquire political philosophy and is essentially easy to build consistently in your games as long as you target it fairly soon after you get to Civic. The amount of gold this can unlock for you throughout the game, especially if you do end up building another wonder or two in your capital later, is definitely worth the investment of production and or chops needed to secure the wonder for yourself, in my opinion anyway. Hey, if you found this video helpful at all, I'd really appreciate it if you took a few minutes of your time and shared the video with anybody you think it might help. Whether that's directly in a personal message on Facebook or in a Facebook group, on Twitter or Reddit, it's all good. It would really go a long way to helping a small channel like me get discovered, but whether you do or not, let's get back into things. So, tip number five. Well, honestly, it's basically a wonder and not a tip. It's officially called Orzagaz, I think. Don't quote me on that. I honestly just referred to it as the orgasm wonder for the reasons I'm about to get into. So this beauty of a wonder was introduced with Gathering Storm, but I honestly think it's flown under the radar as far as popular wonders go. Machu Picchu, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the Panama Canals kind of stole the show in my opinion. So what Orzagaz does is literally doubles the amount of diplomatic favor points you earn per turn for being suzerain of a city-state. That's crazy good in literally every type of win condition you could be going for. Whether you want to just sell off all the diplomatic favor points like I do, or you want to sort of get the best of both worlds and sell some and save some for the World Congress, or if you happen to be chasing a diplomatic victory and want to use all the diplomatic favor to control the World Congress, this wonder is a fucking beast. It's unlocked with the sanitation technology, which is something you're going to be getting anyway in most games to get the sewer for increasing your city populations or to unlock the door for chemistry tech for your research labs if you're going after a scientific victory. Well, that's all I got for today. I sincerely hope that you found these tips helpful. I know they aren't earth shattering and groundbreaking by any means, but they are quite powerful and can have a huge impact on your games immediately. But I'm going to shut up now, so I'll just see you in the next video.